Esther Berkey, the author of the biography Living Without Fear and the co-publisher of the Amazon best-selling Inspired Journey. Get in touch with me if you want to start living without fear or writing your book. And please share this podcast with a friend who you know needs to hear this episode. Subscribe to my newsletter and my YouTube channel write a short review and rate it on your favorite podcast platform with a lot of stars if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your support. This truly means a lot to me. And today I'm so excited to have Lisa Hazmer from Michigan with me. She is a practicing psychotherapist for over 24 years and has recently expanded her scope of helping others heal as a spiritual empowerment coach, fueled in large part by her own spiritual healing journey. Her passion is helping others explore a compassionate understanding of why they are the way they are so that they can discover their personal spiritual connection, heal how they feel about themselves, and learn to thrive in their lives. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like it's a great honor. <laughs> it's an honor to have you, Lisa. So let's jump right into the first question. What has been your turning moment in life? Well, I feel like the biggest one that stands out to me um, was maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And I had gotten a reading from a psychic medium and I had had other readings before and they were all fine. But this one just was like the right message at the right time in my life. Um, because what it did for me is it, in a very different way, let me know that I truly am not alone, that I have support from the other side, from loved ones and whatnot, that really were with me during my toughest times. And the reading itself was great, but what it did is it somehow sparked something in me that I wanted more. I wanted like, I needed to know how do I find this kind of connection in like my everyday life? Um, I had grown away from the church that I was raised in. And so for a long while, I was kind of just lost and searching and so I did a funny thing. I went online and I took some type of a quiz about what religion best suits you. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up finding um, a church that I had never, ever heard of before. Um, it's a religion that's called spiritualism. Um, and it basically looks at the, the beauty of connecting with people that have passed away and that there's energy all around us. And it is a huge part of their actual um, church services. And so it was just interesting. So I started going to that church and down the line, I um, developed as a media myself, I developed being able to do energy healing and I started doing speaking there. And it just excited something in me so great. Um, so it's almost like that part was awesome, but then it also then led me to really wanting to understand kind of the deeper parts of myself and like what parts of me needed healing. But I just, it all, it all started from that one reading that just was magical for me. So you aren't alone anymore. Yes, which is one of those things that I, it's what I believed already to be true, but there was just something different about knowing it. You know, it's that the difference between belief and knowing, um, because I, the evidence that she gave me that day was like, oh my goodness, it was so clear to me. 
Um, and I've carried that with me forevermore, just knowing in the moments where I feel like I'm struggling, they're right there to help me and to guide me, not to fix everything for me, right? That's not their point. They're not here to fix everything for us, but they are here to guide us and just let us know that we are loved. And who is especially there for you? Do you know exactly? Um, in that that pivotal reading, it was my grandfather. Um, but I know that I have, you know, a lot more other people that were once my family that are, are now in spirit. Um, but honestly, now I do more direct connecting with what I would just call my spirit guides who I believe, you know, were with me before I was born and their, their job, if you will, is to help me while I'm here. Um, so now I talk directly more to them more often, <laughs> but I still appreciate, I kind of look at it like there's a whole team that are, that are there helping me out. Hmm. How big is your team? Do you want to talk a little bit more? It's, I'm just curious. I don't know. Yeah, I wish I knew because I, 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 there's, you know, the family that I've lost that's now um, in spirit. So there's a handful of them. Um, but here's the thing. I feel like we don't really know. I, I know that I have also a handful of different guides that I work with. But those are just the ones that I know. Um, I know that when I um, started a new phase of sort of my emotional healing journey, um, I had what I would just call a new guide step up close to me and say like, all right, we're ready to tackle this big emotional thing right now. And I'm right here, like we're right by your side. Um, so I don't know if I can tell you how many, because I think they're just each waiting for mm. their opportunity mm. or what thing I might need them for. And which topic you needed healing the most? Lisa? Um, so in that moment, it was working on my relationship with my parents, which I know from some of your work, you are familiar with. Um, and so I, I knew I needed to bring some healing into that part of me and also find my inner strength. Um, and so I had a new guy that stepped up and said, okay, we're ready now. Let's go. Do you want to share how was your relationship with your parents maybe before just shortly and how it's, it has developed now? Um, so I feel like growing up, um, it seemed pretty average, meaning my parents took care of my siblings and I, and um, they worked hard to try to provide for us. We were not wealthy by any means, but we had everything, you know, that we needed. Um, they, what I can see now that I didn't totally understand back then is that they did not know how to provide a lot of emotional nurturing. So they were not super attentive. They were not um, really attuned. They weren't very curious about us. And that sort of led me to a place of having a lot of self-doubt in myself. Um, the tricky thing is, I think when, when there's not overt abuse or overt neglect, it's almost harder to pinpoint um, the struggles that we carry inside of our heart because it's not such an obvious thing. It was just like the day-to-day -day life and it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't nourishing. And so my healing journey for myself has really been pivotal around that of how do I, how do I nurture me? How do I nourish me and allow others to as well? Cause I sort of had developed a protective wall around me a bit, even though I really, really wanted it. And so yeah, my self healing journey has been understanding those parts of me. And ironically, that to me is where the spiritual stuff that I've experienced has come in to be a huge part of my healing journey, right? 
because I've been struggling with, you know, how come my parents can't love and nourish me? And there's work to be done around that and knowing that they did the best that they can. But now I also have this spiritual connection that is always available to me, that is always loving for me. And that has been a huge part of me working on my healing is how do I access that so that I know that I'm loved and supported. So it's, they kind of all end up folding together. Mm -hmm. I can so much relate to what you said about your parents, the, about the emotional um, help. You didn't get it. Yeah. And uh, I know how it was for me as well. And now you're able to, to help yourself to get with your guides. Yes, how, yes. How, how do you do it when you feel when your self-worth isn't isn't there at the moment or if you have mm. doubts, whatever? So um it's interesting because I was just listening to one of your podcasts recently where you were referencing a part of what I actually do. So I was like, oh, listen to that. That's cool. So when I am struggling, I often will sit down in, I call it meditation, but it's not the kind of meditation where we're trying to like clear and not think about anything. Um, so I sit down and I close my eyes and I say, okay, what, what are we feeling here? I'm feeling self-doubt. I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling scared. And um, I allow, I almost have parts of myself that are all kind of interacting in my mind. So there's the part that's sad and then the part that says, okay, you're allowed to be sad right now. You let that sadness be right here. It's absolutely welcome. I see your sadness and I love you, right? So it's all of the nourishing, nurturing stuff that I didn't necessarily get fully in childhood, but I'm giving it to me now. And, and then, so I kind of will do that and let whatever shows up come up and Usually there's lots of layers to that, but then I had in this other piece of after I've allowed myself to feel my feelings, I ask my spirit guides, like, what do you want to tell me about this thing? Or what do you want to tell me about me? And then I just listen to whatever pops in my mind. And it, I used to really struggle with, am I just like making up an answer there? Like, <laughs> is this just what I want to hear? And I had to get okay with that of like, okay, what if it is? What if I am making it up? As long as it feels good, I guess that's okay. But then I had interesting things happen where like word, the wording that would pop into my mind would not be words that I would normally use. So I started like, sort of realizing like, like what? Um, goodness, I can't think of a great example. Um sometimes it just sounds much more formal, I guess. Like I'm a pretty, um, I don't know, I'm an informal speaker. And, and sometimes the language that would come into my mind would just sound very formal. Um, and so I just started recognizing, like, I don't think that's me making it up. I think it's something else. Um, and it, again, again, as long as it made me feel good, I was okay with it. And it, of course it always feels good because it's always loving, always, always loving. That was a big thing too, of my spirit guides are never going to call me stupid or weak. Right. So if, the, if I have those things pop in my brain, those are not my guides. <laughs> those are parts of me that I probably learned again in childhood. <laughs> so distinguishing those was important mm. and if for example what, what happens also with me because I visit my parents nearly weekly so we are to spend time together and there are a lot of triggers still mm -hmm. how do you cope with these triggers by your parents um great question <laughs> it has been um definitely a learning process. 
of learning when when does it feel emotionally safe for me to do that? When does it not? But when I am with, um, so my dad passed away a few years ago, so it's just my mom. Um, so when I do that now, um, I try to prepare ahead of time. Um, so I might do some meditation with my guides and I say, um, meditation and then I do something sometimes that's called tapping um emotional freedom technique so I will prep myself ahead of time and I will kind of program myself to say when I'm with my mom and she triggers me because she probably will let me know that that is only my sign to come back and tune into loving me she is helping me learn how to love myself even more deeply right so it's a kind of a mind twist if i had a super easy mom would i feel loved yes but what would happen when i got into the world and not everyone treated me like that right so the, i kind of look at the complex relationship that i have with my mom as part of my lesson of like learning how to love me despite what's going on around me so I kind of program myself of going there and I'm like okay so when this happens here's how we're going to respond <laughs> and it helps it helps love it and the, if you have other people triggering you nowadays it happens to everyone what would you do or what can you recommend um I think it's so important that when someone, when we feel triggered, um, I look at triggers as a call to healing. It's letting us know that there's part of us inside of us that needs healing. I don't think we're going to get through this life without triggers. I think um, that's part of our growth. I think it's part of how we know ourselves. So when people, I guess, trigger me, um, I mean, my I, honest to goodness, even though I'm a psychotherapist, it's not to say that I don't sometimes have not so great reactions because I do. I still respond. Sometimes I have things that I'm unlearning, but I now can pause and go, ooh, what is that trigger about? That person is acting in this way. What does that mean? It sounds like such a weird question. What does that mean about me? If that person's acting in that way, what does it mean about me? What part of that do I need to clean up or remind myself or whatever? Um, sometimes that means boundaries. Sometimes that means communication. Sometimes it means the other person really didn't do anything and it's just my old stuff that's coming up. So It's all, it's all data. It's all data in our healing journey, I feel like. Hmm. Love it. And now people are coming to you to get healed. How do you proceed? You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So um, interestingly, I end up doing a lot of the same work with my clients. So they come and they say, I have anxiety or I have depression or relationship issues. And it's a lot of helping them to tune into what emotions are going on and actually allowing them, like, I have to help a lot of them. Like, let's pause there for just a minute. Can you just tune into that sadness and just let it be here? Because we're all so used to trying to get out of it that I look at it like we're shushing, we're shushing our inner child. We're telling them, be quiet, don't be sad right now. And so it's helping them just be okay with their feelings and providing some of that nurturance that maybe they didn't receive too. And then honestly, with, with people that are open to it, because I'm not ever here to push my beliefs on anybody, but when people are open to it, whatever their spiritual understanding is 
I will try to bring that in. So it doesn't matter if it aligns exactly with mine, if they grow up or if they practice a specific religion. Cool. Let's figure out how do we bring that in here? Because I want for them in whatever way makes sense for them to tune into that spiritual part and allow it to help them. So I do a lot of that. I do a lot of, um, I'm a big fan of um, understanding the law of attraction. And so I do a lot of things with like, ooh, let's figure out what energy we're putting out into the universe and what what we're attracting back to us and how do we tweak that a little bit? Um, so it's it's, again, it's like a lot of the same stuff that I've worked on in my own healing journey is what I end up bringing both to my psychotherapy clients, but then also to coaching clients as well. And how about anxiety, fear? Mm -hmm. Those are, um, I look at anxiety and fear. Well, I look at anxiety as um, there's beliefs that go on inside of us that are telling us you can't handle something. <laughs> you can't handle the things going on and ah and so let's let anxiety be here let's understand how does it how does anxiety believe it's trying to keep you safe right now let's lean into that let's feel that right and again providing the nurturance and um helping them to see themselves through a more compassionate lens and and again, that's where the spiritual stuff comes in handy because that source is always loving and compassionate. And do you see the spiritual guides people have, but maybe they're not aware of? Um, so I don't see any of them, but I, I, my belief is that every person has them. Um, it's very interesting to me how how many people that seek me out um, haven't really known this part of themselves and they're not necessarily coming to me and asking like, hey, help me find my spiritual stuff. Sometimes I have that, but most of the time people aren't. So they're, but they're all looking for it. They just don't know that they're looking for it. <laughs> they haven't known to ask for it. And so I introduce it to them very gently and always with them being in control of where we go with things. But um, yeah, a lot of them are so grateful that I'm opening that door for them that they now have access to all the time. Mm, beautiful. Is there something else, Lisa, you'd like to share with our audience? Um, I think, well, so I, I think about... Um, about your podcast and your book and and the role that fear plays I guess in our lives um I had this really interesting experience a couple of years ago um I did a high ropes course for the very first time I don't know if you've ever done one so you're way up in the air in the trees on like really high platforms and there's all these crazy obstacles that you have to go through <laughs> and you're harnessed in right and you have all these hooks and harnesses so you are you're literally safe you just don't feel like you're safe <laughs> and it was the first time I'd ever done one and it was way harder than I thought it was going to be to do that whole mind over matter thing and there was four levels to this course and I struggled through the first level. Like I wanted to quit so badly, but there was nobody around for me to quit to. And I get to the end of it and I'm like, that's, I'm done. I'm, I don't need to go to any other levels. I'm good. So everybody else, my family that I was with decided to go up to level two. And I said, you have a great time. I will stay down here. Well, by the time they got done, I said, I don't want to do level two, but I feel like I want to do level one again. I feel like I can do it better. And I, I don't want to leave here feeling like it kind of beat me. And so I went up and I did level one again. 
And it was less scary, except for one part. One part became actually scarier because my muscles were (laughs) kind of freaking out. Um, But I left that experience not only feeling like, okay, I at least conquered level one, but I pretty quickly afterwards realized that this was such a metaphor for me facing things that I was fearful in my life about. And just this realization of like, so the things like, like you brought up earlier about like, okay, I have to, I'm going to go be with my mom. And I know my mom is going to trigger me. The lesson of, okay, it's not going to kill me because I, I wasn't going to die up on the high ropes course. If I fell, I have a double harness, like I'm going to be fine. It's just my belief that I, that it's going to be bad if I fall. So I, really took that lesson as like when I'm facing things in my day-to-day life that feel scary to me of just realizing like this is what I'm here to accomplish though I'm here to accomplish facing my fears head on and knowing that they're not going to beat me right and and embracing that instead of trying to like avoid that all of the time this is what I'm here. This is what growth is. This is what learning is. This is what we're here in life for is to like, let's face it head on. It's not in most cases, right? We all need a healthy dose of fear, but in most cases, it's not going to kill me. I just have to know that I can get through it. Mm. Even if I did fall, right? (laughs) Even if we do fall when we're trying to do something, it doesn't mean it's bad. Our assumption is it's bad. Wonderful, Lisa. Thank you so much for having been here and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, dear listener, for spending your precious time with us today. And in case you feel worthless and nobody seems to like you, we tell you, you're amazing. We love you. And you're a gift to everyone who crosses your path. And please tell yourself these sentences over and over again. Have an amazing day and talk to you next week. Mm